one. Okay, welcome to the Extra Type Talk podcast with me, Andrew Aziz, and you... Yeah, George Pavlo. Good to see you again, mate. It's been a while. Yeah, long long time. So it's it's nice to be back on the podcast. Um, just for our listeners, just so you know, I'm a Newcastle United fan. And George... Yeah, I'm a Palace fan. Crystal Palace. Palace. Oh, yeah, well, I think we're both long-suffering fans. Um, <laughs> um, and this, this weekend sees us... Newcastle going to Selhurst Park on Saturday, um, a place that I think we don't have a very good record. Yeah, well, mine yeah, right, yeah. rightly so. Yeah, Go. I think it's good first first game. I think it's good first podcast of the season. We can actually it just happens to land on the t- fixture between our games. That's quite nice. Um, yes. I mean, how do you think your season's been going so far? We haven't really, you know. Yeah, um, pretty terrible. Um, I think obviously we're we're nineteenth. We're saved by how bad um, Burnley have been. I, I would say we've only had really two good first, two good halves of football, which were um, in the first game against Spurs in the second half, and against um, on the weekend against Arsenal in the first half. But really, we've been we've been really struggling to be creative. We've struggled to keep clean sheets we've had a tough fixtures to be fair but we are we are really really struggling and i think it's just down to not investing in the forward players that we really needed which is a long-standing issue in newcastle how about yourself are you happy yeah it's been it's been a bit of a mixed start to be honest i mean first weekend of the season was a great win obviously fulham 2-0 away um with their you know big improved squad as well spent a lot of money i think the biggest spenders of any newly promoted team ever if i remember correctly so it was a good win there but then it sort of faded since then liverpool was a good performance i thought to be fair it was just it was liverpool was a good team um but then watford after that just was a pretty poor performance in my opinion and then southampton was even worse and Huddersfield last weekend, um, we I think I mean it was good that we got the win, obviously, but I didn't think we played particularly well. I think we were quite fairly lucky to get that win, even though we probably did deserve it. Do you do you think at the moment would it be unfair to say that you know if Zaha plays, you have a chance of winning. If Zaha doesn't play, you become more like a relegation kind of side. Well, I mean, we've all got we, we've all got guys. To... I mean, we've lost what. <laughs> what was it 12 games in a row that we've lost without yeah. him I mean it's, it is getting ridiculous now and the thing is it's not so much the point that he's not a good player is he's our only good player because he's not we have got other players in the side who are good but it's just the case that we don't know how to we're not used to playing without him There's no, we haven't got a plan B mm. I mean our, our plan is pretty much just when we're away from home sit back hit him on the break and we need Zaha's pace and trickery for that and at home we're relying on him mm. on the fences and just you know, get get us the ball and all that. So and without him, without that, because we don't have a player like him that can have that has that same sort of style. It's hard to recreate that. What we need to do is change our strategy and maybe focus through the middle instead. I mean, we've got the likes of Max Meyer who doesn't play very much. Um, we need to get him on more. And when Zaha's he's on astronomical yeah. ast- astronomical wages, if you believe what was written in the no, paper, I, I he's on over. No, the, the papers are reporting something like 150 grand. There's no way we're paying him that. Apparently, the figure is more like something like 80, which I mean, is sti- which is still okay. Fine, but it's nothing we can't. I think the tech is on 100 grand a week. So, um, mm. what? Um, so, Wilfred Zaha has been quite outspoken this week. Obviously, he came out after the match on. Was it Saturday when he he was stating that he got unfair treatment by um, by other players, and then today he's come out with a interview where he said that he was depressed in Manchester yeah. when he went to Man United. The club didn't give him a car, which everyone else got, and that's why he was so depressed. Even though he's on fifty thousand pounds a week, which I always find I just find uh, kind of. Uh, uh, a bit interesting a comment to make but um what do you what did you make of his comments last week after the match well, i think the whole car comment is more of a status thing like if i mean even if you, it's, it's not so much that he doesn't have one or that he can't afford one it's the case of if he's everyone else has been gotten one except him that's what makes him feel like he's less like less worthy or something and yeah. when you're coming into a new club it's not great to hear that. So um, I can understand. I can kind of understand his frustrations there, even if he does seem like a bit of a child about that. Um, but the comments he made about the—I um, mean, obviously, 
the man, I mean, you could see at United it wasn't working that well. He said that, you know, it was the first time he lived away from his family, he said. So that was obviously going to affect him. Um, so I don't blame, I mean, the move at United, he wasn't a Premier League, I mean, he was a Premier League player at the time. He had the quality, but he wasn't the player he is now. So he needed that sort mm. of coaching and just sort of tut um, tutoring in general. And since he didn't have that, like, he, he didn't get that properly because, you know, as soon as Fergie signed him, he left and let Moyes take him over and he just didn't handle him well. Mm. So I think United was just an unfortunate case, really. Um, but he's back to it. Um, so so I, I can understand his frustration. Because people say, you know, he wasn't good. You know, he flopped at United, so he's not a good player. That's clearly not the case at all, as we're seeing. So I think he just wanted to... He's been has those frustrations for a long time and wanted to get that out. Um, uh. Yeah, I, I think that basically he was signed at a time and if, let's say, Fergie had stayed on for one more year, then he would have had someone who's not under pressure, could have looked after him, played him here and there, weaned him in. Instead, he came in to David Moyes, who struggled from the beginning. The job was too big for him, struggled all the way through. So he's less likely to give opportunities to a um, to a young player who you know is, who at the time wasn't Premier League proven as well. That was a was a big thing because I, I remember actually he he came because he went on he went to Cardiff on loan yeah, didn't did. he for the last yeah, yeah. and I remember watching him that game and he was very very poor and if you told me the player he is now like there was just so I think the whole Manchester experience and probably just um, may have you know scarred him for a bit. Yeah, I mean. With the, I mean, I, one of the things I said when he was at, when he was at Man United and he needed development was the perfect game to bring him on would be like a cup game against like you know Rochdale or someone, or in the Champions League yeah. game where they were already five 0 up and like he could just get on and do his thing and not yeah. worry about anything. But instead, you know, Moyes brought him on. His only sub appearance was pre in the Premier League, I think, against I think it was Sunderland, I think it was, and you know he stuck him on with one 0 down and said go and win us the game. I mean, I mean, how much pressure can you put on him there? So yeah. I think, yeah, yeah, I think you're right about this. But I don't really want to dwell on the Man United thing too much as the problem. And I kind of, I kind of wish he hadn't made those comments so that we could just sort of, because I'd completely forgotten about that to be honest. Mm. What he was like at Man United, but you know, he wanted to share his frustrations, and you know, he's getting some flack for it, unfortunately. But there you go. Yeah, I think the other thing was that last week's comments, the way he did it as well. It kind of overshadowed his amazing goal, which yeah. is a bit frustrating for him. Maybe he chose that. I, I mean, I can understand his frustration because, for me, the Kapu in the the one where Kapu's kind of yeah. put his foot that is terrible, really. That you know that is for me. That's a that's, that should be a five match ban, let alone a three match ban. Yeah. Well, he didn't um, have ban anyway, so. Yeah, that's that should be. I mean, that is something probably that if they VAR had seen, they would have um, would have picked it up really, and he should should have been given a red card really. Um, I think to be fair, out of all the players in the Premier League, probably him and Hazard are the ones who get fouled the most. Yeah, I think the stats are. I forget if it's ha Will um, <laughs> Zaha or Hazard that's first or second, but they're definitely the yeah. top two. Um, yeah, I, think, I mean, comments. Oh, sorry, go on. No, I just, I mean, I've having watched Hazard. You just watch all the time. Everyone is just constantly looking to take him out the game, and um, but he does get up and he just keeps going and keeps going. And maybe Zaha might realise that now he's such an elite player that unfortunately this comes with the territory of being a top yeah, player. Well, yeah, I agree to an extent, and I think. Well, first of all, I think he does get up. Um, a lot of the time, it's only when he's got a real crunch yeah. on it, having he's having literally having difficulty getting up that's a problem. Um, but he, I mean, it was a comment he made about how you know he needs more protection. I think he's got a point because, like you said, he's been the most fouled player for a long time now. So, and you, you see, referees are just consistently not giving a decision. You can argue that's his reputation for diving, you know, whatever. But at the same time, even if that is true, then you know your referees are still supposed to do their jobs. And and I think that. With the, the amount that, so, I mean, like you said, Kapua, is in, Kapua could really have done him some serious damage there. It was frankly, yeah. it was lucky that he didn't. And the fact he didn't get any punishment for him, retrospective punishment. I mean, I think he's, I think it was because he got a yellow, he got a booking for it, and you can't give yeah. retrospective bans when you've already been booked. I think that was what happened. But the fact that it was, I mean, it, it's clearly not. If he's if he's given a booking, that means he's seen it, 
And if you've seen it, mm. you must be able to see it's a straight red. So I don't, I don't understand that at all. And I completely, and I'm not just talking about with protection. I think players like Hazard as well do deserve that sort of thing. I mean, we slagged Mourinho off years ago for, you know, complaining about people attacking Hazard. But you know, having seen the whole Zaha situation myself, I think you know maybe he had a point. It's the sort of thing where, obviously, players got to take responsibility and get up as well. But referees, you know, if players think they can get away with kicking the hell out of a player, they're going to do it because they're going to do whatever they can to get the best player off the field. So, yeah. I think as well, when you... I mean, Huddersfield's game plan on, on that weekend seemed to be stop Zaha, you stop yeah. Palace, really. That's all they've done since they went. So, since they've come up and they've, that's all they've done since they went. Yeah. Passed, so. I mean, I can, I can imagine... Um, Cardiff will have a similar when when you guys play Cardiff because having watched Cardiff this season they they are very they some of their tackles are really kind of quite over aggressive. I do think that in the Premier League we do need to um, be careful and manage it because when maybe in Spain it's too much the other way, but. Players like Messi, Bale, they get protected quite well from those type of challenges. Yeah. But I guess we don't want to take the whole physicality out of the Premier League either. No, we, it, so it's, it's all about balance. It's all about balance. Yeah, all yeah. About balance. yeah. But, I mean, um, well, I mean, there's, there's for Cardiff, there's Neil Warlock as well, so he knows exactly how good Zaha is. So yeah, it'll be another bloodbath there as far as that's concerned. Um, <laughs> but I mean, I mean, okay, I mean with Newcastle though. I mean, we've sort of gone on about Palace a lot now. Um, yeah. I mean, I suppose really it's Newcastle's really more so dominated by what's going on off the pitch rather than what's going on on it. Mm. I mean, you know, there's not. I mean, it's with a, we might you say underinvestment. This is what the third, second year in a row or something like that that they've had that. And even before then, the only reason they had it, it was like one season out of six they actually spent a lot of money. That's only because they were in dire need or something like that. So I mean, the potential's clearly there. So many clubs would give, would kill to have Rafa Benitez as manager. I'd love him at Palace. Um, and he clearly wants to stay, and he loves the club, and that the club loves him. But it's just, it's just the people at the top that are making things so difficult. And it's, it's fr- from an outsider's perspective, it's frustrating. So God knows how you guys feel. I think generally this season, he firstly, he we were the I think we were the only club to make net profit from the transfer window. So. And last season, it was clear we needed to, the main things we needed to strengthen were the attacking wingers and the striker and the guy who plays in number ten. They were the real key because that was the thing. We weren't a team which was full of goals, and if we we were defensively solid, but if we improved the attacking, then we would have progressed. Yeah, I mean, he spent um, so he let Gale go back. To, he let Gale go on loan. And he decided that he doesn't want Mitrovic, so he sold Mitrovic for a, for a high price. Yeah. I know he's yeah. scoring, but 20, 27 million is a lot of money um, for someone who last time we were in the Premier League didn't really. He was starting, didn't score many goals. I personally would not have sold him yeah. because yeah. I think he's much better than Hozalu and um, Gale, who obviously we let, we let go. Um, He's, he's However, as well now, so yeah, he is. And I, 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 from from what I've read in the papers and so forth, it seems to me there was a personality clash. Um, yeah, it does. It, it does that, sound like that because I mean, yeah. he seems like the sort of player that, even though he didn't do too well for you guys before, the sort of player Rafa could maybe get something out of, especially with the way you guys play. Um, I, I mean, I guess it's just one of those things. I mean, to be fair, twenty-seven was it? Thir- was it thirty million? Twenty-seven million? You got them. 27 million, 27 million. Yeah. I mean, that's to me, that's not a great price for this market. To be fair, I mean, it's a good amount of money, but considering how much a lot of strikers mm. go for nowadays, um, but even so, the okay. yeah, the issue, the issue with Newcastle, I've always said this, is we've sold players before. There's no point having money in the bank under Ashley because he doesn't spend it. Yeah. So in in kind of a hindsight, I just wonder whether Rafa should have said no. You, I'm not going to sell him. Because you're not going to re- you're not going to replace him. Um, yeah. I mean, we've brought in Rondon, but he's on loan. He's not even a permanent signing. It's a loan swap, so, it's a loan swap with Gale, so it's just yeah. it's the highest order. Yeah, he also he has brought in Yoshis, Yoshinori Mutu from Mines, who is a winger, who at the moment looks like he's got potential, but 
he's still a bit too lightweight for the Premier League, even though he's been playing in the Bundesliga, which is a bit physical. So he he might be a work in progress. But generally, I think, considering we were expecting three top attacking players to come in, we've it was a very disappointing window. Um, the other thing which is a bit kind of kind of fr- frustrating is that it seems that what last season Ashley said once he gets premierships safety secured he'd be willing to sell the club that hasn't happened yeah. reports yeah. this week are that before he's been asking for close to 350 million supposedly he's dropped his price down to close to 300 million so we'll have to wait and see I, i'm not convinced that he is willing to sell cuz no. We've, I've heard these stories for ten years. So well, until the paper is signed, I think that's when I will believe it. Yeah. Well, as far as football's concerned, I mean, he's really got a gold mine there at Newcastle. I mean, a fifty thousand fans that show up week in week out, regardless yeah. of what league they're in. Secu- you know, Premier League security. You know, all the TV money and all that. He's got no reason to sell it. Like yeah. the only way, like I, I hate to say it, I because I know how loyal Newcastle fans are. They don't want to stop going to games. But really, the only way to stop is to just give him as little money as possible and make it so mm. it's not a worthy investment anymore. Money. That's the only way you're going to get him out at this rate. Yeah, I think I think a lot of fans have thought. So there was a protest before the Arsenal game where, in front of the club shop, they did huge protests. But really, is that going to make any dent into Mike Ashley's pocket? Not really. I think the only thing to do would be to pro so to um, to boycott the matches. Yeah. However, yeah. a lot of people, it's their leisure, it's the thing they enjoy. Taking that away from them yeah. is it's all is this all is this always everyone's going to have their own personal opinion on. Should should you boycott a match? No, I I, um, I I hate telling fans they don't want to have they don't want to you know not to go to games or whatever because especially yeah. especially in Newcastle where people love it so much. But uh, it, it's I mean it's really hard to say. This is what makes this situation so difficult, really. Yeah, I think for Newcastle going forward, this has happened before. We've been in last season. We started very badly. Hopefully, Rafa can turn it around. However, we have been relegated twice in nine years, mm. so this is not a new situation for us. And you know, so <laughs> we'll have to wait and see how things go. I think a lot of people say, "Oh, Newcastle." Sometimes people are here on the radio say, "Newcastle too big to go down." We've been down twice now, mm. so it's it's not something that we've become used to under the Ashley regime, unfortunately. So we'll have to really wait and see if there is any kind of takeover and what is going to happen. Rafa's only got a year left on his contract as well. So that leaves a lot of things kind of what will happen with him because I think at the moment Newcastle's best asset is actually their manager, which is not many clubs have that situation. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. And I mean, I said at the beginning of the season, as long as you have Rafa, I think you'll be fine. I mean, he got you guys to 10th last year, so that shows you how much he's worth. But, I mean, it's it's the, it's the long term, really. It's what happens after that. It's how long can you keep him, and when he does eventually go, what are you going to do then? It's That's, that's the thing. The one, the one thing I'll say with Rafa is I'm not sure where he would go. And I know it's, he's a top manager, but if you look at in the club, so in Spain, he's managed Real Madrid... He's he's had his he had his chance at Real Madrid. Unfortunately, it didn't work out for him. He's not going. They'll never imp, they'll never employ him at Barcelona. Atletico are quite happy with their manager. So really, the only clubs I could see him going to is perhaps Valencia or Sevilla, possibly, which would be good enough for him. In Italy, he's he did really badly at Inter. Uh, did all right at Napoli. So again, where would he, where would he fit in Italy and in England? I don't think there's too many clubs, kind of top seven, who who would go for him. Personally, I think he would be perfect for Everton because, you know, he's he's a top manager. Yeah. But again, he's he's managed Liverpool. Would he go to Everton? 
considering they're the closest rivals. So I, I do think he he might be a little bit limited about where he can actually go just because of his previous experiences as well. Yeah, well, what I'd be worried about is if a club, because I don't think he'll go to the likes of a Chelsea or a Man United or a Man City. I don't think he's good enough for them, unfortunately. Um, but I do think the worry for me is if someone like an Everton or Valencia sacks them and is on the lookout as my manager and yeah. a new manager, he's he's obviously going to be linked with them. So that's yeah. What I'm about. The one thing is with the Valencia is would he want to go back? He is seen as a hero in Valencia because he won the UEFA Cup, he won two league titles there. I personally don't think after you've had such a amazing experience somewhere i don't think you should go back because you don't really want to tar your legacy no but i can i, I get that but i sort of also think that if he's had if he's had a you know great time there already the fans yeah. love him it's more of a welcoming atmosphere to begin with and i think he was good enough for them so but i i, I don't know i mean it's sort of i i'd personally more if i was in his position i'd personally fancy valencia over someone like everton yeah. For that reason alone, I feel like even if I didn't do as well, my reputation would still sort of. I think they'd still look back in, unless I took them down to like you know, like got them relegated three times or whatever, which I don't think he will. Then I, I think I think the memories overall will be positive. So I mean that's my opinion on the thing. So yeah. anyways, and the actual game itself. So I mean I think you're right about Zaha. If he's not here, then I think we'll definitely lose um, because that's just the way we work. But I do think he will play um, this weekend. But. Even if we does again, we don't we don't have a good record against you guys. Um, so it depends. You've been playing very you've been playing playing quite defensively so far. I mean, that's to be fair. You've been playing against the bigger side, so you probably won't have the same tactic have against us, especially since you need to start getting points on the board. But if you do sit back more, I think we could have trouble breaking you down, and it could turn into another frustrating draw like last time. I think I'm hopeful that we can get another result like last time. However, just the lack of goals is concerning me a bit. Um, I do also wonder whether we'd be able to handle Zaha. I think really the whole game will depend on if Zaha plays well. Um, also be interesting to see how Andros Townsend does, because he, he usually plays very well against Newcastle. So um, Obviously, he played for us for a few months. So yeah. it will be... I think the match is pretty much dependent on Wilfred Zaha, really. <laughs> and I think that's I think that's the when you get below the top six, really it's that if you have a top player like Zaha is, maybe like in for Leicester Vardy is, it really does depend on those real quality players that the the other fourteen teams in the Premier League have on how they do really. Yeah, um, I guess, yeah, I mean, that's just, that is a bit worrying that we have to rely on one player so much, but that's the position we are right now, so, I don't know, I mean, what do you think, what score predictions, what do you reckon the score is going to be? Um, two all? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that could happen, yeah, I'm definitely, yeah. I, I think it'll probably be a draw, personally. Um, I'm going to go 1-1, one, one, like last time, um, I think that's a pretty safe bet, um, although I do think we definitely could win, and I wouldn't be surprised if 2-1 win for us. But yeah. I do think 1-1 one, one is what the score will be. So that's my opinion. Yes, we'll wait and see. So yeah. let's talk about the Champions League. Yeah. Um, firstly, what do you think of the uh, new kickoff system which started on Tuesday with a five... I mean, it was, I had to rush home from work to catch the Inter Milan Spurs game. What do you think of the 5.55 starts for the, in the way they're trying to get it so we can watch both two matches in the evening now? Well, I think um, I think it's they're trying to do it like the Europa League, aren't they? Um, I mean, it's it's a bit of a weird one um, because I feel like first, I mean, obviously, it's, it's, I mean, the nineteen forty five is traditional, so that's obviously going to cause some backlash to begin with. Um, but on a fifteen fifty five, I suppose the argument is that it makes it easier for fans, particularly away fans, since they've had to travel that far um, in the first place. They haven't got to work or anything. Because um, they're more yeah. likely staying the night, so it probably makes it easier for them. But the home fans, I mean, you know, if they're ending at like five o'clock, they've got what less than an hour to get to the stadium, mm -hmm. to get home beforehand. So that does make things more difficult for them. And a lot of a lot of fans aren't within a one hour radius well, of exactly, the exactly, yeah. the stadium, especially in London. No, having well, to rely on the tube, to, you know, trains. 
it's, it's very, very difficult, especially for some of the London clubs to get home for those times. Well, even if you are in the London area, it can take you sometimes take you more than an hour to even get to where you want yeah. to go. So that's what's annoying. Um, but I suppose you know they don't. That's the problem, isn't it? There, there's so much money in football nowadays, and most of it comes from the TV money as opposed to yes. the crowds. That they're just not concerned about the crowds anymore because the TV they're much more worthwhile investment. I think we're seeing, especially even in Spain, in Italy, the kickoff times are so varied. There was almost, I mean, Serie A on Sunday, I think there was four different games. So you can watch four games back to back on the Sunday. So the first game starts at 12.30 Italian time, I think. And so we're seeing more and more kickoff chain times are changing across Europe just to maximise TV audience, really. Yeah. I mean, unless, uh, unless we can, unless we stop buying, unless we stop, you know, if we, there's enough yeah. plummet in the TV money, which there won't be because it's a worldwide thing nowadays, the Champions yeah. League and the Premier League, then I guess that's reality is what we're going to have to accept, um, unfortunately. I mean, I mean, when, I mean, mean, when, how long until they start playing Champions League games at 4am for China? I mean, well, yeah. it's, it's, it sounds ridiculous, but the way, with the way it's going, it's a possibility. I mean, one of the things that people have started talking about is whether they're going to move you know, certain games in the Champions League to the weekend to, again, maximise... I mean, they, they already moved the final, which used to be a Wednesday night. Now it's a Saturday, it's usually a Saturday evening. Yeah. So we are slightly seeing changes, and there's already been muted that, you know, the, the final might not be in Europe anymore. It might be abroad again to maximise... I think we are seeing more and more globalisation which is good for the global audience, but maybe not good for the local fans. No, yeah, I mean, with the whole no. moving it to Saturday, the, the, moving the final to Saturday night, I'm not too concerned about, because it's sort of like, I mean, it's, it's normally when the season's over anyway, so it's not like there's any team that's got to play there. Um, and it probably makes things a bit easier for fans as well, because it's the weekend. Um, so I'm not too worried about yeah, um, so individual Champions League games, regular matches to the weekend. I mean, all these teams have got to play on the weekend anyway, so how's that going to work? Are you going to start moving certain I mean, league games to, like, a Wednesday or something yeah. and have even more Wednesday night games? I mean, as a neutral... It's just yeah. seems too complicated. I mean, as a neutral, it was kind of nice to watch... Because usually I would have been only able to watch one of... So I would have only been able to watch one of Inter Spurs or Liverpool PSG, but because of the times, I was able to watch both. So, but obviously it's not good for the for the local fans. On to the games themselves. So, if we start with the biggest game probably of the week, which is Liverpool PSG, yeah. fantastic yeah. match, really great atmosphere at Anfield. One of those great European nights that the, their fans always talk about. What did you make of the game? I think Liverpool have already set an early claim for their, you know, Champions League credentials. I mean, finalists last year, and this will definitely convince some people that they could probably get there again. Um, I thought it was a really great match. Um, I thought it was really entertaining. Both both really good teams, and I think they had their styles really matched well to make a good, entertaining game. Um, it was for me. It highlighted. It still highlights Liverpool's biggest problem, which is their defence. I mean, to be fair, PSG is not an easy team to contain. I, I don't think conceding two goals against them. Um, is, is shameful by any means, but at the same time, in a Champions League home match, you like to try and keep as many as as little goals as possible. And I feel like Liverpool, I mean, bringing in Van Dijk has definitely helped things, but I still think there's that little bit of inconsistency in their defence that they need to fix if they want to start winning trophies. Mm. I think it was, in terms of, I think we, in, in this country, we always see PSG as kind of third or fourth favourites for the Champions League, possibly behind Real Madrid, Barcelona. Um, I think that match highlighted there is... Because for me, PSG did very, very little. They um, they were very lucky that Salah misplaced that pass um, to allow um, Mbappe... I think Neymar did the dribble and then let Mbappe through, isn't it? The, I think that, so. Yeah, so that was... That was very fortunate for PSG because I don't, considering how much money has been spent on that squad, I don't think they were good value for the amount of money they've spent. The other thing which was quite interesting was a lot. If you look at where a lot of Liverpool's 
forward play was coming from. It was really coming through Trent Alexander-Arnold on the right-hand side because Neymar wasn't tracking back. And a lot of Liverpool fans were saying Neymar wouldn't get in their team because he's not a team player. He doesn't he doesn't track back. You know, Klopp wouldn't wouldn't be able to tolerate that. I mean, it, what looking at Neymar? Do you think he might not be due to his you know lack of a bit of team ethic? Do you think he would get into the top four uh, Premier League sides? Well, that's a big question, isn't it? Um... Well, we all know about his attitude. It's highlighted very well at this point. I mean, there was the whole, you know, penalty-taking incident last year. We all know he can be a bit of a, you know, egocentric sometimes. Um, but, I mean, his, there's no doubt his ability is there. Um, it's just how he uses it. And I think I, mean, it's, it's, I think saying he's not valued for money is pretty obvious. It was a world record fee. You'd expect a world record player. And he just, he's been good and he's obviously been great for them. But he hasn't been, he hasn't been at that the same level that he was at Barcelona yet, I don't yeah. think. Um, so until he reaches that level, you can't possibly say he's value for money. Um, but the big, the top four sides, I think, I think you're right in saying he wouldn't get into Liverpool. Or the Liverpool fans are right in saying he wouldn't get into their side. I mean, that shows how far their attacks come, I suppose. Mm. With the likes of Salah, Mane, Firmino. Yeah, I, I don't with how much they, how much effort they put in. I don't think he would get in, even if he is po- probably more talented than all three of those. Um, but I mean, Manchester City, I don't think he would. Because I think their attack's superb already. Um, t- Spurs, I think it's hard to say. I think he probably would. He definitely. He probably would. would yeah. Yeah. I mean, because I mean, Spurs, I think he would. Yeah. He'd yeah. He'd yeah. Probably I mean, get in where Lamella or Son usually plays. Yeah, but definitely, and I think they need yeah. more pace in the side as well. So, um, who's left? Um, Arsenal, Man United. Yeah. Uh, well, I suppose not. I, I mean, it's Arsenal, Man United, and. Um, and Chelsea, Arsenal, Man United, obviously yes. And Chelsea, you'd probably, I mean, with Morata, how Morata's been doing, and they haven't really got any striking options. You'd like to think he'd get in there as well. Mm. So I think, I, yeah, I, I, I think the big thing with Neymar um, is a lot of people are a bit fed up of his antics now. I think, like you mentioned, I think the penalty taking incident. A lot of people felt it was very disrespectful to such a great player like Cavani. You then have had where he's been quite disrespectful with some of the tricks he's done during the gun matches, which has made him a bit hated in France. And then obviously the diving at the World Cup, which was just too much. Um, I think everyone was... So I think he's not the most popular player. Um, And so he really needs a big season really in the Champions League rather than in Ligue 1 to really show that he is... Because the whole reason he moved to PSG was to show that he was up there with Messi and Ronaldo. And I don't feel he's shown that yet. Yeah, I think so too. Um, But, I mean, you've got to give credit to Liverpool. I thought they were brilliant last night. And I think it shows if they can replicate those sort of performances in the Champions League and the Premier League... I mean, that's the, that's the thing, is their inconsistencies, really. They can do well. I mean, they beat Man City last year, one of only two teams to do it but they just slipped up against the smaller teams. So, I mean, it's it has been their story for ages now, and if they can get that yeah. forward, um, and then their defence is melted, I slated them, it is definitely getting better. So if they can keep improving on that, then, you know, I'd love to see them, I'd love to see them win the Premier League, love to see them win the Champions League. Um, it'd be nice to see just a, just a new face do it, and I think they deserve it as well, because they've suffered a lot in the past, and hopefully if they keep going like this, they might actually get somewhere. Yeah. I think, like we said, I mean, they were only a... A Lorius Carius good game away from possibly winning the Champions League so yeah. last season. So okay, on to the our current Premier League champions, Manchester City. Shock home defeat to Leon. Um two big things coming from the match was one, people were quite surprised that Leon, a kind of modest club, were able to beat Man City. And the other thing was the attendance at the Etihad. I think it was Closer to forty thousand, which was down thirteen thousand compared to the the game on the weekend against Fulham. Just wonder what your thoughts on that were. Yeah, I mean attendance. I mean, there's no point. I don't think anyone needs to talk much about the general attendance at Man City. I mean, we all know what that's been like for the past few years. I think the thing with City fans is, well, not necessarily City fans, but football in general. When you when you hit a peak. Um, of supporting your club, it's hard to really get motivated and excited after that. So, for instance, for City, you know, it was the it was it was their first 
title win, you know, with the Aguero moment and all that. As, they, as brilliant as that was, they had full houses, you know, all the way up until then. And after that, the attendances just dipped because that was such a high moment. You really can't get much better than that. So it sort of interest starts to wane there. And the same has happened this season as well. I mean, even though attendances weren't that great, you know, they had the best Premier League season in history last year. And, you know, it's sort of where do you go from there after that? I mean, you can try and get better, but it's very unlikely, especially how they've started the season. I mean, um, that's an interesting view. I do wonder, I don't think they have enough fans generally. I think they're still developing their fan base. Because I think if you look at if Tottenham, Arsenal, Newcastle, Everton, all these clubs were in, say, like last year when they were in a Champions League quarter-final. I mean, Man City didn't sell out for the Liverpool match, which, when you think about that, is probably one of the most memorable matches of last year. Yeah. And if they're unable to sell out for that, then how are they get? How, you know, how can... How, club is really lacking a, you know, big fan base to get over the kind of 50,000 fans through the gate. So... I do think that it's going to take time. Obviously, they've you know the ship, the owners have been there for ten years, but if they want to get up there with the Man City, so Man United, Barcelona, Real Madrid, they are going to need to do more things to engage and get more fans through the gate. Yeah, I don't know if I agree about the fan base bit necessarily because I think they have had quite a big fan base, yeah. especially about how big a city Manchester is, and they tend to be more of the city club. Most people from Manchester tend to support Manchester City rather than United. Um, but I think that I definitely think I, I agree with the whole engaging thing because um, I, I think the club there's definitely more of a disconnect now with the fans than ever before um, so I definitely think that's something that needs sorting out if they want to get their attendances back up um, but I mean the game itself um, you could argue that attendance was part of what got them that result you need to good, create a good atmosphere to try and get you a good result um, but I mean yeah um, there's not really I saw in I'll be honest in the back of my mind I had a feeling this would happen at the beginning of last the end of last year because I mean that you always seem to do there's always a bit of a that that doubt over after you've won your first title that sort of can you carry it on and there's always a bit more pressure that comes with that it's hard it's much harder to defend your title and um, even though this wasn't a league match um, it's sort of shown that their performances are slipping a bit. I think I think in that game you know you there was two things. One was the Guardiola teams are susceptible to the counter-attack, and that's why they've struggled so much against Liverpool, who are perfect at counter-attacking with their front three. And the other thing was the still playing Fabian Delph as a left-back, which he, you know he really struggled on that second goal. And they did come back into the game in the second half, and Bernardo Silva scored a good goal. But perhaps in that type of elite game, they do miss uh, Kevin De Bruyne, um, who's obviously out injured at the moment. Yeah, definitely. He's definitely a massive loss. He's probably their best player, in my opinion, either him mm -hmm. or, um, him or San Sané, personally, for me. Um, but, I think, I mean, I'm, I mean, obviously, big respect to Leon. So he went there and did a great result. I've always sort of, I, I mean, I've always sort of liked Leon as a club. I don't know why they always sort of stuck up to mind for some reason. I think they are a uh, you said they're not that prominent. I mean, I get what you mean, but I think they're a little bit. I not mean, they were. They were. France. No, they were prominent pre PSG being bought by Qatar. Well, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah pretty much. they were winning the league title quite often until PSG obviously have been taken over by um, the Qatar uh, Qatari group since then. It's obviously now we yeah. see PSG. I think PSG have won six out of the seven titles. Yeah, well, I mean, I get what you mean. The scale isn't the same anymore, yeah. but it's. You know they've shown they've shown what they can do here and they've done really well. Um, but with City, I feel like um, I just feel like that's sort of a that sort of a result that could possibly. I mean they won all of their games in the group last year, I think, except for maybe the last one. Um, so you know this sort of feels like could it maybe do well their Champions League season? I think certainly there's people are going to fancy them now. Yeah, I think the one thing they're lucky is their group is not the strongest. So. They have Shakhtar and Hoffenheim, who whilst they're good teams and you know, but they're not like what Spurs have with Barcelona and Inter Milan. No. So they might be able to guess away with it as long as they don't put in another 
kind of laxical, laxadaisical performance like the one on the one yesterday. Yeah, I definitely think that they'll get out of the group. I don't think there's any doubt about that. And I think Guardiola will use this game to push on and be better because that's the sort of manager he is. Um, I mean, he after the three nil defeat on the weekend, he got them in for extra training, and maybe he was seeing things which were worrying him, and maybe that kind of transmitted itself into the Lyon game. Yeah, maybe. I mean, speaking of well, speaking of Spurs and Inter Milan, um, that was. I, I mean, I, that was the result. 2-1 against them to Inter Milan. Um, I'd argue that was probably... I'd, even Inter Milan, I'd argue it was probably a shock result since Inter aren't the team they used to be anymore. I think it's their first time back in the Champions League in a while. And Spurs have sort of become... You know, they won their they won the group last year with Real Madrid in it. They beat Real Madrid 3-1. Yeah. So it's quite a, quite a big blow for them, really. I think, look, if you look at the result, obviously you look at it and you say... Well, Tottenham now have lost three games in a three games in a row. They lost to um, Watford, Liverpool, and now into Milan. Looking at the game itself, for the for the majority of the game, Spurs were in control. Um, Harry Kane has a one on one, which maybe if he's in his top form, he takes. They took the lead through Ericsson. but then kind of it seems to me that Inter came into it last twenty minutes. Icardi has scored an absolute beautiful goal there. It's kind of a mishit cross um, from the left from Asamoa. It's just landed perfectly. I mean, Icardi, I think he's only ever scored four goals from outside the box for Inter Milan. You know, so yeah, he's done. Yeah, he's done very, very well to connect with that. And I think that goal then kind of makes a team which is lacking a bit of confidence sit back a bit more, and then. Second goal comes right at the end, and it's a real a real blow for for Tottenham, obviously, because you know that three points was in their sights, you know, t- ten minutes to go. So it's it is frustrating for Pochettino. I'm sure he's a bit. I think he he's been a bit tetchy in the recent press conferences. I've seen him. He was he he got upset when people kept questioning him on why he left Alderweireld and Trippier at home. And he was a bit upset with some of the questioning after the Liverpool game. So I think he's under pressure in terms of from the media. I don't think he's under pressure from the fans or anything. But just really, really tricky, tricky set of results they've had recently. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think with the whole... Um, with this, I mean, when you score, when you can see the goal like that, um, like Akali scored, it's you never want to be on the receiving end of one of those. No. It will always, it will, that the goals like that in particular will dip your confidence a lot. It's just hard to recover from them. Did, and I think we saw, I think we saw that with Spurs, where as soon as that went in, they just sort of. I think with the general tired, you know, I think they were generally tired at the end of the game as well. So it was just unfortunate. Ama- that really yeah, happened. amazing that Akali, he such a beautiful goal. Couldn't get into the Argentina team or squad for no, the World no. Cup. When you look at how poorly Argentina did, and he wasn't even um, he wasn't even in the squad. No, well, you, it makes you wonder how far they could have gone if they did have him. If he could score, well, if he could score yeah. goals like that every week is the thing. So, I mean, Argentina's underperformance. When you consider, you know, Cardi was left at home. They had Dybala. They had, a, they had a couple of games where Dybala, Aguero and Higuain were all on the bench. I mean, <laughs> still, I still struggle to work out how that team did so badly at, at the World Cup. Because I know they got through the group, but they really scraped through the group. Um, amazing yeah. how, how much they struggled, considering what attacking talent they do have. Well, I think when you've got Messi in your team, you tend to rely on him, but that clearly didn't work. Uh, I mean, okay, so last Champions League game um, of the English clubs, Man United, 3 0 away at Young Boys. Um, I don't think this is really going to mean that much to Man United fans, to be honest. I mean, they've had an inconsistent start, to say the least, so a 3 0 win is quite really welcome. But I mean, it's it's probably, with this, particularly with what Man United's fan base is like, it's probably quite an insignificant win to them, wouldn't you think? Yeah, I think, to be honest, I think the main thing is they wanted to come out of that place with no injuries. Everyone was talking about the plastic pitch before. And the plastic yep. bit afterwards, the main thing is they got the results. And the positives for them was Pogba 
um, scoring a nice goal, also scoring the penalty, and also Marshall getting off the score sheet for the season. They, they're the positives. I think they'll they'll they've now got tougher games now with against Valencia and Juventus, where really it will be they'll probably be more more key games to the group. Um, Valencia started the season quite poorly in Spain and, and are struggling, so I think really be between Manu or Valencia who goes through alongside Juventus. Yeah, I mean, if Mourinho wants to get back on side of the United fans, then he's got to win the big games. It's as simple as that. Yeah, I think, I think especially, I think the Juve game will be a real acid test for how well they are doing now because seeing how Juventus did after they lost Cristiano Ronaldo to that very minor incident, um, <laughs> very, very minor. I mean, I don't don't know how, I, I mean, I was watching it on um, satellite and, you know, John Barnes is saying, hey, if that's a red card, how is anything, what is a red card now? Because it, so I think it was, I, I personally think if that isn't Cristiano Ronaldo, he doesn't get sent off. I'm not sure if the ref wanted to make headlines. But Juventus have done well to win there. And obviously, signing Ronaldo, their main aim is to try and win the Champions League because it's been quite a long time since they last won it. So it'll be, I think it'll be fascinating to see how Juventus... I think man of the Champions League week is obviously the man Messi. Another hat-trick for him. I mean, career hat-tricks now 48. I mean, some strikers don't even score 48 goals, let alone 48 hat-tricks. So he's done, I mean, he's just keeps raising the bar, doesn't he? Yeah, definitely going to be hard for someone to take his crown when he eventually moves on. Um, so quickly, before we move on, uh, quick fire question. Who do you think is going to win the Champions League? Um, I think it's going to be very tricky to say. I do think Real Madrid aren't the same team without Ronaldo. I think it will show in the bigger games where they, they kind of need a goal and they'll miss him a bit more. So, personally, I think, for me, I probably would hedge my bets on Liverpool this season. I just think they're a bit more suited than Manchester City to the Champions League. Yeah, I'd, I'd probably say either Liverpool or Barcelona, personally. Um, I mean, they nearly went the whole season unbeaten last year. They clearly, they've done, they haven't had a great start to their, um, their La Liga campaign so far, to be fair. But, I mean... I think the um I think without Ronaldo at Real Madrid that'll definitely boost their confidence a little bit um in both senses and they had a great win um against PSV as well so I think they're well equipped so I think Usman those... Dembele is coming good for them as well because obviously yeah. when they first signed him he had the injury and then he's he struggled for form but now he's scored quite a few goals so I think that will help because last year I think they were a bit too dependent on Messi and Suarez so having a source of goals with him and Coutinho now as well, means that Barcelona are, they've got more goals in them. And it will be, again, I think, I think like you said, that I think they'll be right up there as one of the front runners for the Champions League. Yeah. Yeah. All right then, so just the, back to the Premier League then, finally. Um, we've got, I mean, there's a couple of games. We're not going to go through every game, obviously. We'll go through the, probably the biggest ones. There's no massive clashes. Um, yeah. Like the big six. Um, so we'll go through what we can. Uh, I've already talked about Palace Newcastle. Um, so next one's Cardiff v Man City. First one, the big team. We talked about Man City a lot. What do you think make of Cardiff start so far? Um, Cardiff played very, very well against Newcastle. Um, they should have won really, um, but I think generally you see, you know, you you get what you get with Neil Warnock's sides. He's he's working on a limited budget. He hasn't really been able to add too much. I think the only kind of big signing they made was Josh Murphy from Norwich. Um, I think it'll be very difficult to stop Man City. The main problem Cardiff have is obviously they don't retain the ball for long enough. So I can imagine that possession stats probably on the weekend against Man City will be 25 to 75 probably in Man City's favour. So I can suspect that Man City might comfortably, comfortably win, especially they'll probably be really keen to put that Leon nightmare out of their system. Yeah, they'll want to get over that European hangover for sure. Um, so, I mean, Cardiff, 
It's it's. I mean, I they they are. I think they've done okay. Considering how everyone was convincing them to do at the start of the season, I think they have done okay. Um, Chelsea at the first half, I thought were very impressive. Unfortunately, it all fell to pieces. But I mean, it's Chelsea, so what do you expect? Um, but overall, I think the performance was okay. Um, this round of fixtures for them, they should have gotten more points against the likes of Newcastle and Huddersfield, in my opinion. Um, because that's that could have set them up big time because they've got some time coming up now. now Manchester City the being the second of them. It's the lack of goals. They, they, yeah. they I think they scored through Sol Bamba, didn't they? But they do they do yeah. they do lack a, a I think the, the main strikers have got a Zahor and Ward, who in the Premier League are they gonna get more than five to ten goals? I don't think they are. So I think I think every team in that kind of who are in that relegation dogfight? It's really who 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 has someone who can score them the goals to get out of it. Southampton have Danny Ings, you know, so really they're going to struggle for goals. I think in terms of their forward yeah, yeah, options. Yeah I, yeah, I definitely think they'll go down. Um, unfortunately, for Cardiff fans, but I mean, I reckon you know there's still time. I reckon they could. I reckon they could get a couple of shock results. Um, but I don't think today that this weekend will be one of them. So I think this could turn could. Potentially be a very comfortable win for Man City. Um, so next up, the team for Southampton. I'm going to avoid making any, you know, parent club jokes or yeah. Southampton players, whatever you want to call it. I'm not going to make any of those. <laughs> um, but how do you reckon? I mean, with Southampton, I mean, it's been a. They didn't start well, but then they they beat us obviously. But then they threw um they threw away a two goal lead against Brighton in the last minute. So yeah, I I'm, I found it amazing. I mean, I I am always amazed by Mark Hughes. Whatever the result. He, somehow the referee has played a part in his mind. Uh, I really, I, I, I do find that Mark Hughes now, he's, you know, he's quite, you know, he was a very good player. You, you know, he played for Man U, Barcelona, Bayern Munich. But I do find his obsession with the referees saying a penalty like that, which was really, really obvious to say that it was soft. Just, I just don't know where he's coming from. I think Southampton spent a lot of money during the summer, and I think he has um, he's brought in Armstrong, Aonusi, Danny Ings. All those additions m- might give them enough firepower, but I think they're going to struggle at Anfield. Um, Klopp has started to rotate the squad, so he was able to bring in Henderson and Sturridge on the weekend. Oh, sorry, against. PSG. So again, you can see him rotating a bit. It might be a game for maybe Shakiri to get a chance. I think as well. Obviously, a lot, of, lots been made of Mohamed Salah's and the form's not really. He's not really kicked off this season. So it'll be interesting to see if he can move to, to find his form. But I do fancy um, Liverpool to beat Southampton. Yeah, it's worth noting as well that Danny Ings is actually ineligible for that game because he's still on loan. Oh, yes. Yeah, the season, that's so true. Yeah. I think that'll probably lower Southampton's chances even more because he's been big for them so far. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, next, uh, after that, May United v Wolves. Um, I've been impressed with Wolves so far, actually. I think everyone tipped them for, like, loads of people tipping them for, like, Europe or something. I don't think they'll quite go that far. But they've shown, you know, with all the money that they've spent, all the Portuguese players they've got, they're clearly adapting to life in the Premier League quite well. I think the the big thing with Wolves is they have in the Premier League in possession is so important and they have two players there who are people who retain the ball. Neves, Moutinho are players who will always keep the ball. So I actually fancy them that they could go they could go to Old Trafford and get a point. Um because they they have they they're more than capable against Burnley. They should have scored two or three. Joe Hart's had a great game. He's kept um, kept um, the score down. So the the one issue I have with Wolves is they they don't have a twenty goal a season striker. Um, yeah. So I think at the moment they're relying a bit on Raul Jimenez. They they're using Bonatini a bit. They've had Adama Traore playing. Um, as a sub, really. So I think probably in the next, I'm sure um, Mendes will find some sort of Portuguese striker, you know, and that they'll, uh, you know, they'll they'll sort that problem out shortly. Um, but I do think that it will be a very very close game against Old Trafford, just because they've got they've got the players who can keep the ball and can really cause United some damage. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, Troy Allway, I'm a massive fan of. I really rated him at uh, when he was there. And I think, for me, he would have been the perfect, you know, backup slash replacement if we needed him for Zaha um, mm. at Palace because he's exa that exact sort of kind of player. He's really the only player I can see that could do that job. So I was a bit disappointed we didn't go in for him, even though I can understand yeah. circumstances because he cost a lot. Yeah, of Ian, Ian, um, Ian Holloway said he's the fastest player he's ever seen live. Yeah, well... <laughs> That, that says something right there, and yeah, I would have loved to have had him, but I mean, Wolves have got him, and I think he's I think he's been a key asset for them. I think he'll do really well, um, and I can definitely see them getting something at United, yeah, especially with how inconsistent that they've been. So, yeah, I think I think it'll be a big test for Mourinho. Obviously, his end his agent is uh, Mendes, so um, there may be a slight conflict of interest there. But um, I do. I think he'll be a. I think that's probably the game of the weekend, Manu Wolves. Probably, yeah. I mean, it says something about the rest of the games, but um, yeah, that I would probably say that's the game to watch as well, really. Out of yeah. You can see. Um. So Spurs up next. They're going. They're away to Brighton. Yeah. Um, in the evening kickoff on Saturday. So, I mean, Brighton have had sort of a. They obviously they did brilliantly against Man United, but that's been their only win so far. Um. They did well on Monday night to get a point at Southampton, I thought. Um, and they came, I mean, the second time they came from two goals down against Fulham as well. I think it's been a decent start for them. Pretty mixed overall, I'd say. I mean, it's very nice of a Crystal Palace fan to be uh, complimenting. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it's still a very... I've got to be impartial. Yeah, be impartial. I mean, it's a very strange rivalry. Some of our listeners might not know... Can you explain yeah, the rivalry? We could, whole, we could do a whole podcast on that one. Yeah. Don't, don't you worry. Could you explain it briefly? Just I have read the reasons. Well, yeah, it's sort of like basically Alan Mullery when he was a fan of Brighton. Um, there's an incident, a couple of incidents during cup games, like a retaken penalty. Um, the Palace fans gave him loads of stick, and he turned around and gave some back basically. And since then, the two clubs have sort of it's just have grown more into that. Again, I do want to. I mean, I'll I do want to tell the story in more detail another time because we could that could take up a whole quite a lot of um, <laughs> yeah but... I think it's definitely one of the um, one of the stranger rivalries just because of the distance because you know th there was the Brighton fans on the radio who were saying they don't see Brighton Southampton or Brighton Portsmouth as their rivalries they only see it as Brighton Palace which is fascinating yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I think for, for, for Spurs it's such a big game having lost three in a row, um, if they will really want to, if they want to stay in contact with Liverpool and Man City, they really, and Chelsea, they've really got to win this weekend or they will again, they'll, they'll again, they'll be nearly men again. Um, I think the constant talk about Harry Kane not playing well must be getting boring for um, Spurs fans. I mean, Tottenham not spending a single pound in the transfer market really is going to come back and haunt them. I know a lot of people have said, you know, it's hard to attract a striker to play um, second fiddle to Harry Kane. But you know, if you if you're, you're if you're a striker, you probably can think, oh, I could play alongside him, or you know, they they could probably back themselves because. You know, if they had bought in a top striker, he probably, because Kane's struggling for his form, probably would be playing at the moment, but not buying anyone. I just think it was a bit short-sighted from Spurs. Yeah, I think Spurs are in a Newcastle-ish scenario in fact that, you know, Levy, Levy doesn't really want to, I've probably butchered this pronunciation, but, you know, he doesn't really want to invest that much, um, you know, in, in terms of probably what he should be spending. Um, yeah. Probably definitely be spending more than zero in my opinion. Um, but I mean, to be fair, I think they've done good business in the sense that they've got their players on new contracts. They managed to keep hold of them. That's just as valuable business in my opinion. But at the same time, if they want to challenge for a title, they need to make more additions. They, everyone knows, then they're, they're still not ready yet. Um, they're relying very much on their head like players like Kane, Ali, you know, Ericsson, those sort of players. They haven't really got any solid backup that the likes of Man City have got. So. You know, it's 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 a hard one for them, um, and I can definitely see them falling at Brighton. Because they've got a very good home record, um, but I think I think it'll probably end in a draw. To be honest, um, I think Spurs could win, but it'll be tough for them, and particularly after after um, 
Wednesday night with, or was it Tuesday? Whichever one, the Champions League game, um, with such a, you know, with such a late comeback, that would probably shot them quite a bit. So I think it's, it'll definitely be a tough game for them. Yeah, and I think I think everybody will be watching Harry Kane, isn't it? I think, um, I think in this country we are obsessed with him at the moment. Um, I mean, I don't think many strikers can say they won the World Cup Golden Boot but they only really played well in possibly two games of the World Cup. I mean, I mean, you know, yeah. for him, for him, he can always say, look, I've won the World Cup golden boot. But I think England fans will remember how much he struggled against Sweden and against um, Croatia. So, um, yeah, I think we'll all be um, keeping an eye, keeping an eye on him. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, uh, Next, I'm going West Ham Chelsea. Oh wow! Um, that's proper London yeah, that's derby. the um, London derby. Yeah, I've, not the first one of the season. There's been a couple, yeah. um, but I mean West Ham got their first win of the season at Everton. Probably a shock result, especially considering how they've started. Um, yeah, I mean, do you think they could? Do you think they're starting to gel together? Do you think they could get something here? Well, I mean, they did spend over a hundred million. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I I watched the uh, watched the Everton game, and I think. Um, one of the things which made a huge uh, difference was that they brought in um, Declan Rice and Obiang to play alongside Mark Noble. Um, before, they'd been playing Noble with Wiltshire and there just wasn't enough legs in that midfield. And I think especially against Liverpool, they were just getting overrun constantly. Um, last week, Declan Rice came in. Obviously, he's at the head, the um, centre of a... Uh, which country is he going to play for Rao at the moment but he, he came in and did really well and I think that kind of gave a platform for Anatovic and uh, Yarmolenko to really show like their attacking talent I think they really need to build on the momentum but I think the the issue is obviously playing a Chelsea side that have got a 100% record Hazard is possibly one of the best players in the world at the moment um, with his form, the one bonus they might have is they might have Chelsea might be suffering a bit from Europa League um, hangover. Obviously, they've had to go to Greece tonight to play in uh, against Parax on Salonica, so maybe that's the only advantage for West Ham. One thing I think West Ham fans are a bit wary of is obviously they've struggled at the London Stadium. Um, for atmosphere and results as well. So it'll be interesting to see what the atmosphere is like um, against, well, you know, one of their main kind of local rivals. Yeah, um, I mean, there's, I mean, apparently there's stories coming out. Wilshire's going to be out um, injured yeah. again. He's going to be out for about five weeks or something. So, very, very I mean, sad, isn't gonna... it? Very sad. Yeah. 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 Well, well, that's the price of signing him, yeah. afraid, I, I guess. So. It's, it's well, I mean, he'll obviously be he'll be a big loss for them. Um, so I think I think they did do well, and I think I think in Pellegrini they have got a good manager, and with the money they spent, you'd like to hope it would come together. Um, but I think Chelsea is just a step too far for them at this point. Um, mm. I think they're they're absolutely flying at the minute. Hazard's definitely been the player of the season for me so far. Um, and I think Chelsea have probably just got too much quality for them, but. You know, West Ham can pull shock results out of the bag. So you know, I did. I did think last week Pellegrini did some great management. You know, when this whole story about Lucas Perez refusing to come on um, against Everton came out, the way he just deflected and talked, tried to, you know, possibly denied it. Did said this whole thing. Oh, Antonio was ready, so we brought him on instead. It was just great deflection from um, you know an experienced manager. Because, you know, when you think about how Mancini handled the Tevez situation, you know, yeah. It, yeah. it was just such so different. And I think sometimes managers, what they really, just a few key words in certain interviews can blow up a whole situation or diffuse a situation. And I thought that was really clever from, you know, obviously, I think he's, he turned 65 last week. So, you know, someone is, yeah, yeah so he's again. very, very experienced experienced manager and I think he'll he'll want to carry on his form because West Ham fans are quite a uh, passionate bunch so he really needs to keep the momentum going yeah I mean Pellegrini he's 
Uh, he's the sort of manager you'd be reassured to have in a dressing room scenario because he's, a, you know, he's a very collected, calm sort of manager. So, you know, he, he, you can maybe question his tactics all you want, but situations like that, you know, he's a very reassuring character to have because you know he'll just handle it properly and he won't fly off the handle or anything. Um, so that's, I think, I think hopefully he can do better and because uh, I think he, he can do well there um, and hopefully West Ham fans can warm to him. Uh, so last up, we've got Arsenal v Everton. Um, two sides who have both got new managers and have had not, you know, pretty unimpressive starts to the season, all things considered. I think um, for, I mean, obviously I, w I watched Arsenal last week. Um, I think one of the key things I took from it was when they bought on Torreira at half time. He really changed the game. Um, I'm not quite sure why he's still not starting because he, for me, is if you look at their midfield, central midfielders, he possibly is the best ball player out of all of them. So I think he made such a huge difference um, when he when he came on. Um, the other player who you know did score and hopefully for for Arsenal fans, I think they want to see is because is Mezzozo. He really you know considering he's on three hundred thousand pounds a week. I mean, which in this. Where is just so much money, you know, he really they really need to try and get the best out of him because I think what if Ozil can find those passes and find the space for Aubameyang and Lacazette, Arsenal will always score. So I do fancy them against Everton because they they do they do they are creating a lot of chances. Yeah, Everton haven't been too impressive either. I mean, they started out well, I thought. Did brilliantly for them. Um, I think he was sent. Was he, was he was sent off? Yeah, game, he was I sent think? off. So I think he's suspended, not injured, which is good in that sense because he'll be back fairly soon. Yeah, uh, return of Theo. Yeah, Theo Walcott's return as well. So. Um, oh yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, is this his first visit to the Emirates? Since 